Okay, class, in this lecture, we're going to talk about heart failure and cardiomyopathies. So, uh, the Whip and Wasserman gas exchange gears, again, we can't really escape this uh, physiological model. Uh, and I think out of all of the conditions that we'll cover in this course, except for maybe COPD, that this, this condition, heart failure, um, probably best reflects this dynamic interplay. Because as we'll see, as we'll discuss, the changes that happen in patients with heart failure to the circulatory circuit, which we have here, have profound effects on the muscle, profound effects on ventilation of ventilatory cog, um, which impacts the ability for patients with heart failure to exercise, to move, and participate in, in society. And we'll get into some of those physiological ramifications of this condition as well as some of the common body system impairments that we see um, and how we address it from the rehabilitation aspect. So just a quick little uh, caveat. So heart failure is a, is a complex clinical syndrome, right? So it's not, it, in, in the classic sense, a, a disease per se, it's a syndrome. The results from either structural functional uh, cardiac disorder is that either impairs the ability for the heart to eject blood to meet the body's demands, or to maintain normal pressures um, in, the, in its chambers and the lungs as well, right? So it could either be impaired pumping performance or impaired relaxation or filling pressures. Or Either way, we end up having impaired myocardial performance, right? So the heart just does not work as well. It's failing. Now, we end up having these compensations. We'll get to some of those in a bit. Um, but the classic symptoms of heart failure... Right, we see shortness of breath, fluid retention, fatigue, and that's related to the impaired perfusion that we see. Orthopnea, we talked about that, right? Um, you know, basically what ends up happening with these patients because if we have a failed heart that either is not pumping effectively downstream, right? Or um, it's, you know, operating a lower efficiency with elevated filling pressures. When we lay flat, and we have that shunting of blood to the mediastinal structures, if you've got a failed heart, you are overloading an already lo overloaded sim uh, system. That's why we end up getting shortness of breath because we have backflow fluid into the lungs. And they also have this symptom called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, similar to obstructive sleep apnea or sleep apnea, where patients um, get, you know, or when they fall asleep, they wake up very short of breath and dyspneic, and, um, and it's related to some of the changes that we see with, with myocardial performance, similar to what we see with orthopnea. But quite often, again, um, we see this impaired tolerance exercise, impaired gas exchange. We'll get into that in a bit. Skeletal muscle atrophy. There's actually profound changes that happen in the muscle. Autonomic imbalances. There's the metaboreceptor and chemoreceptor gain changes as well. At a high risk of ventricular arrhythmias. We talked about anytime we have a structural change to the heart, can end up having changes to the conduction system, and that happens in heart failure as well, and obviously a shortened life expectancy. Now, why this is such a big concern, as we look at it, it's actually a fairly common or an increasingly common condition, right? So we look at it for, um, you, know, you know, from a mortality standpoint, right? It's about one in nine deaths are, are related to heart failure, right? Can, can be acute, can be chronic. We'll get into the differences between that. Um, and the mortality is pretty high once you've been diagnosed. So it's a, a five-year mortality is about 50%, right? Like half of people within five years of diagnosis don't survive. And it's responsible for about half of hospital admissions. And we're seeing um, a higher prevalence. Um, we think this is because, you know, there are some age-related associations here. So it's one of the most common conditions observed in older individuals that's maybe related to some of the, so the prevalence that we see in, of uh, cardiovascular disease in, in, in older age, in this country especially, we can view heart failure as, some, in some respects, the end sequelae of cardiovascular disease, either you know, vascular or valvular, too. So as these you know, patients with these conditions, heart disease, valve disease, age, the prevalence of heart failure increases as well. And we have an increasingly larger adult pop older adult population, which may explain why we're seeing this rising prevalence and why 
understanding how to manage heart failure from a medical side and from a rehabilitation side has become a, such a hot topic issue because we're going to see a lot more of it. We're expecting the projected cost of managing heart failure alone to be, be about $70 billion uh, annually uh, in about 10 years, right? So it's it's pretty pretty common. Again, we think of it really as this end sequelae of, of myocardial infarction. Um, we'll get into some reasons why, but... Um, Again, it's a bit of a reoccurring theme that if we look at that same plot, right, for physical inactivity, obesity, and heart disease, hypertension, um, which all are like, you know, risk factors for developing heart failure, right, we see a very similar plot along the map. And obviously there is some social, some um, geographical, environmental policy um, structures at play here. Um, but again, it's the same areas where we see a lot of those cardiovascular risk factors, we end up seeing high prevalence of heart failure as well because they're, they're dynamically and, and pretty, pretty intrinsically, um, you know, they're, they're united in some respects. And again, if we look at age prevalence, so again, um, you know, definitely something we're more concerned about working with, you know, older populations, but we can see it, you know, in, in rare cases in younger ages, but, um, you know, as... Um, you know, as we age, the prevalence increases. So if you're going to work with older adults, people above the age of 65 and older especially, uh, this is going to be a condition that you, you really need to be cognizant of. And similar, um, as we've discussed before, that, you know, we, we, view, we view heart conditions, right, as, as something that only affects older men. Well, if we look at the data for heart failure as well, you know, while there may be a higher prevalence of males and, you know, for this condition in younger ages, when we get to older age, maybe there's some survivorship bias, of course. But um, if you look across the entire age spectrum, especially in older age, actually, there's a higher prevalence of it in women. Again, maybe survivorship bias, but either way, this is still a big problem for women, right? It's still a big problem for women as well. So the etiology. Now, this will vary according to the country. Um, but in the United States, ischemic heart disease is the most common. We'll get into kind of why. Um, but when we have a you know, heart attack or ischemia to the myocardium, and it you know, either dies or has poor perfusion, it begins to have structural changes. That Remember that eccentric remodeling we talked about where the heart kind of gets wider um, and a little bit thinner and it, you know, or there's scarring? That's kind of what we end up seeing here. Uh, hypertension. Right, so if we actually, if there's been, this has been a study that if we, you know, if, if our blood pressure isn't controlled, if it remains elevated, you know, above 160 over 90, um, your, your risk for developing heart, hyper, or heart failure goes up quite dramatically. And there's also idiopathic causes. So there's idiopathic cardiomyopathies that can, develop, can cause it, certain infections. So viral myocarditis um, can lead to it as well. Um, from any, any type of virus can cause myocarditis. Usually it resolves on its own, but sometimes like it doesn't. You have these permanent structural changes. Chagas disease, big concern in subtropical areas. I think Venezuela is seeing a, a big boom in it is a big concern. Uh, certain toxins, so alcohol, uh, cocaine, other drugs as well can cause changes. So I believe there's even certain anti-cancer uh, or cancer or chemotherapy drugs that can cause changes to the heart different valve diseases, and then, of course, prolonged arrhythmias. So there's a lot, of, a lot of different things that can contribute to this. So we're going to talk a little bit as well about myopathies, right? So, um, again, separating the two, right? So cardiomyopathies are um, a group of diseases involving a primary disorder of the myocardial cells uh, with result in myocardial dysfunction, right? So cardiomyopathies are changes to the muscle, Right? They can lead to heart failure, which is either really more a functional defect what, or, or a functional defect syndrome. Cardiomyopathy is describing the changes in the muscle of the heart. And there's three main categories of cardiomyopathies. Dilated cardiomyopathy, so the, 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 the ventricles, the structure of the heart gets wider and thinner. Hypertrophic, so it gets thicker. And then restrictive, which is... It is We'll get into that. It's not so much the mass increases, it just doesn't expand as easily. And we'll get into the differences between the two. So dilated cardiomyopathy. 
right? It's characterized by an increase in cardiac mass, dilation of all 40 cardiac chambers um, with little or no wall thickening. So the walls don't get thicker, they get wider and thinner. And then there's usually some sort of systolic dysfunction because we're losing, again, pumping performance with our, mu with our muscles getting thinner and spread out. Think of length tension, same kind of properties here, right, of muscle. Um, and if it gets severe enough, they'll develop ventricular failure, uh, both left or right. And what ends up happening is you have this, you know, inability to pump blood, which then, of course, translates to impaired exercise tolerance and potentially other changes in the lungs. Now, there can be multiple causes of this. We talked about you know, some of the infectious disorders. Um, myocardial ischemia is a big contributor to this. Uh, chronic alcohol abuse, right? I mean, it's something that I think often gets overlooked. You know, people you know talk about some of the changes with cognition, but like you, alcohol abuse can, in, in um, you know, a leading contributor to dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and then uh, we got to talk about Chagas diseases. I, I always mention this because this is something that was, you know, I was always in the front of my mind. I've done some work in the South Tropics in Nicaragua um, and in Kenya uh, where these things are a little bit more common. And that's always something I always, always, was always worried about, but thankfully I've been able to avoid it. And then uh, there's actually, there's some um, studies now finding that even pregnancy can cause uh, some of these changes um, or we have this peripartum dil uh, dilated cardiomyopathy that occurs in, in, in women um, after giving birth. And then there's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is characterized by um, an increase in cardiac mass. Now, this can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Sometimes the, the volume or the cavity changes, um, or but most often it does not change. So you have this, you know, the dilation of the cavity, right? So we have a thicker muscle, Cavity stays pretty much the same. Um, so we end up having normal or maybe slightly increased systolic function. But what ends up happening is with this muscle being so thick, it obstructs the left ventricular outflow tract. And we end up having impaired relaxation and distensibility. So we lose the you know, capacity of the ability uh, or the ability of the ventricle to, to take in volume. Right? So we have decreased compliance. It's harder for the ventricle to expand and contract, raising filling pressures, which actually makes it harder for the heart to work. Right? So um, we have, while we have thicker muscle here, it's an abnormal thickness. Sometimes it's not symmetrical. And we end up having higher filling pressures, so it's harder for the heart to actually work. It's operating in a lower efficiency. And then there is restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is a little bit different. Right, a little bit different because you, you don't necessarily have changes in the the size of the mass, right? So um, it could be either restriction due to the endocardium or the myocardium or both, and you basically end up having a, a rigid heart. Right? It becomes excessively rigid. The ventricular walls lose compliance, and similar issues, you know, to what we see in hypertrophic. When we have these rigid or stiff ventricles. We lose compliance, right? We, we, you know, we have this inability to fill, and if the compliance is so so low, right, we end up having elevated filling pressures, which can cause backflow into the atria and then back upstream, right, potentially into the pulmonary vasculature, causing other issues there too. Um, common cause of this is amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, certain cancer treatments, right, can lead to this as well, too. Um, so again, you know, quite often we try to view rehab in silos. Well, I'm only working with oncology, you know, cases, or I'm only working with um, you know, these types of conditions. Like these are, you know, these are things that there's, there's usually multiple systems involved with mo mo most patients. And here's just an example. I'm not going to go through all of these here. Um, this is from the, your textbook readings in uh, Chapter 6 of the Turk and Cahalan, Table 4. Um, I review this just to have an idea of the differences between these different myopathies. Um, and again, you know, again, myopathies are changes to the muscle, right, which can lead to heart failure. And they're not the same exact thing, right, because heart failure is a syndrome. It's really more a functional change in the ability for the heart to perform. These are changes that happen in the muscle, which can cause heart failure. And we'll show an example of that in a bit of a nice graph that I think puts it all together. 
And again, here's a nice little cartoon, right? So hypertrophic, dilated, and restrictive, right? So hypertrophic, it gets really, really, really thick, impaired relaxation. This is a condition we talked about in sudden athletes, right? Thickened, thickened uh, ventricular walls, dilated, right? We have everything gets larger and thinner, almost like ballooned. That's the most common type of myopathies. And then restrictive, right? Very rigid walls. Same thing, diastolic dysfunction. It's probably the least common type though. And then I like this example here showing that there's a lot of things that can lead to cardiac muscle dysfunction or your cardiomyopathies, right? So hypertension can lead to a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a valve disease, you know, CAD, right? Or an NMI, right? An acute MI uh, can lead to a dilated cardiomyopathy because of the scarring. Certain drugs or toxins, right? Cocaine, alcohol abuse, um, cardiac infections and diseases like we talked about with um, Chagas disease, right? Um, or any viral myocarditis. So Chagas disease of parasites, it's a little bit different. Um, and then pulmonary diseases, right? Um, is a, you know, another thing we'll talk about as well in our, in our pulmonary unit, that COPD is often a, a cause of, of cardiomyopathies or cardiac muscle dysfunction. And all of these, right? And, and metabolic disease, obesity as well, strongly linked to it. There's some inflammatory changes that happen with obesity and diabetes. Um, but all of these, you know, there's, and there's other out there, as, others out there as well, um, can lead to changes in the muscle. The muscle becomes dysfunctional. And if this muscle becomes dysfunctional, we can end up developing heart failure, either systolic, we lose the inability to pump, or a diastolic heart failure where we lose this relaxation, right? That, Filling pressures are elevated. The heart pumps at a lower efficiency either way. Now, again, this is an example of the remodeling that we see. Again, we talked about this, you know, um, you know cardiac dilations, pathological hypertrophy like we see in, um, you know, our, our, our um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. And then you know, dilation would be similar to our dilated cardiomyopathies. And then, there again, there is physiological remodeling like we see in athletes, right? Um, you know, we see with chronic exercise, um, sometimes in pregnancy, there is a, some normal change because there's higher blood volume. These are reversible though. There's no cardiac dysfunction. This is, this is dysfunctional here, right? And this is an example of just what we see between a normal looking heart, right? And then what we can see in terms of changes, you know, in a, in a dilated heart, right? It means it's, it's the, the cardiac volume is here just get massive, right? And it's just super, super stretched thin, the muscle. And again, um, what we end up we end up seeing with heart failure, you know, we, while we have these changes in the, in the muscle, we have these compensatory mechanisms, which often lead to secondary damage, right? And other issues related to um, impaired uh, muscle performance. And then the, the longer these things progress, the more symptomatic these patients often get. And this is another example of some of the remodeling changes that we see, both uh, they're due to volume overload. Um, or pressure overloads. The pressure overload, we can see this thickening. So pressure overloading would be like valve disease or hypertension, where we the heart has to work against a lot higher resistance. Volume overload, um, you know, where there was you know excessive filling, often due to the um, we we can see with uh, um, you know we see changes in backflow, um, like with a regurgitation. Or you know this can set you know this could be set the stage from um, myocardial infarction, but either way, just an example of remodeling that we see dilation and thickening, and you know just given a, another example of how like big the heart can kind of get. This is an example of a cardiomegaly or just enlarged heart. Um, again, just giving you the borders. Now, typically the heart should take up about fifty percent, right, of the, the this kind of width here. Um, this is an example. I mean, it's close to about 75%. Just, just giving it perspective. You'll learn more about chest x-rays in a later lecture, but um, just giving you a perspective of how big this can get. So uh, that was, again, cardiomyopathies and uh, categories, um, or a, a brief intro to heart failure. Next, we'll get into some of those neurohormonal effects of heart failure. Again, there are these you know, interesting compensations that develop as well.